hope uh, all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. And now we are back to our um, regularly scheduled lectures. Um, so before I start off, I also want to let you all know that we are happy today because uh, we had our endocrine fellowship match and we matched both our positions. So um, we'll have two more fellows join next year. And that's a good thing for us. Um, so today we have uh, Dr. Robert Burt uh, from the uh, uh, Department of uh, Radiology. Uh, he's the Chief of Neuroradiology who will be uh, talking to us. Um, Dr. Burt uh, had been an um, electrical engineer for quite some time before he decided to do uh, medicine and radiology uh, and um, uh, has been at the uh, uh, University of Louisville since uh, 2013, I think. Uh, prior to that, he was at the University of uh, Colorado. Um, he has a number of publications. He has been involved um, in um, and been a PI and a co-investigator in uh, uh, NIH um, uh, grants and uh, studies. Um, He's also well known as a teacher. He has won awards uh, both locally and nationally for his uh, teaching and organization of um, um, teaching programs. So we are very pleased to have him um, talk to us today about uh, imaging of the pituitary and hypothalamus. Uh, we see him every month uh, with uh, in our uh, uh, pituitary conferences. So we're eager to learn more. Um, so Dr. Burt. All right, thank you very much for the introduction and we'll just get right to it here. So we're gonna go over the MR imaging of a lot of different hypothalamic and pituitary lesions. And uh, it, it's quite an interesting and fascinating topic. Uh, you know, when we first learn things like this as a resident, we think that pituitary adenoma is the only thing we have to worry about, but there's a lot more to the pituitary area, the paracella and supercellar regions that all can affect the endocrinology of the pituitary gland. And so we have to keep these more rare things in mind, which is something we learn a lot, I think, in our pituitary conferences where we come across some of these rare lesions. So our goals are gonna to be to become acquainted with the normal structures on imaging. And then we're gonna review a little about the embryology and physiology of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which many of you will know quite well. But it, these things have uh, consequences that we pick up on imaging and we'll go over those. We're then gonna categorize the pathology of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And we'll give some imaging examples of each of those, and we're going to divide this into what happens within the hypothalamus, what's in the gland itself, and then what's in the infundibulum and around it and uh, with the cella. Now, I took out the gamuts uh, on this, which are, for radiologists, their list of differential diagnosis, given that you can describe a certain finding, you have to construct a differential for it. I thought that may be running us over the time limit, so I had to drop those out <laughs> because it's a pretty long lecture as it is. So pituitary development, you remember the anterior pituitary gland starts at the roof of the mouth in Rathke's pouch and then ascends uh, in, from the primitive oral cavity. The septum in between the anterior and posterior pituitary also comes from Rathke's Pouch, and that's an important concept to remember whenever we start looking at, at uh, pars intermediate cysts and Rathke's cleft cysts. And the posterior gland, however, which we know descends from the third ventricle, and it carries all of the fibers, and then the vessels and everything else tracks along that to get down to the pituitary gland. So the posterior pituitary doesn't descend, it leaves consequences too, and we'll see some examples of those. Now, the anterior pituitary has no blood-brain barrier, so what makes things enhanced when we give intravenous gadolinium is a lack of blood-brain barrier. So there's fenestrated capillaries, and the contrast leaks out in the interstitial space and changes the T1 uh, relaxation rate. So that helps us uh, see structures that have 
these fenestrated capillaries. So it, the pituitary always enhances normally. The, it's typically kind of low, it actually is kind of iso intense to gray matter on the pituitary gland to um, uh, gray matter in the adenohypothesis. And then it secretes prolactin, GH, ACTH, LH, FSH, and TSH. But the cells are kind of structurally have, they can be very diverse and appear everywhere, but they actually tend to clump. And so we're going to look at that clumping in a, a little bit of detail because it helps us understand where to look for things like microadenomas. Now, in the septum, it's usually brighter on T2. So a lot of people see as they're scrolling through and you go through the coronal images, and oh my goodness, what's this pituitary sprite? It's just a normal pars intermedia. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind so we don't mistake it for pathology and things like lympho, uh, lymphocytic hypothesis. The posterior gland is often bright on T1. Some people think it's always bright, but it actually isn't. It's probably like 50% of the time. In newborns, it's usually very bright um, because they're very hormonally active at that time. Uh, as a result of getting the get, getting many uh, hormones from their mother, and the nice thing about it is it doesn't fat saturate, so we can tell the pituitary bright spot from something like a lipoma, which happens, uh, which occur quite often around these areas, and of course it secretes oxytocin and vasopressin. Now the anterior hypothesis has this structural arrangement where the outside cells are more typically growth hormone or prolactin, where the inside is a TSH and the ACH. The neurohypothesis is pretty uniform posteriorly, but we're going to look at some other structures around the gland too, the pituitary septum, the tuber scenarium, the median eminence, and the infundibulum. So here's that arrangement. If we were going front to back, side to side with the cavernous sinuses making this kind of cylindric edge on the pituitary. The back is the posterior lobe. The anterior is much larger and it has these ACTH secreting cells kind of clumped in the middle with prolactin around the edges and then anteriorly growth hormone and then anterocentrally is the thyroid stimulating hormones. So when we keep these things in mind when we're looking for microadenomas as to where we might see them. Now the truth of the matter is this is very simplified. This is what you'll find in a variation of this slide in Greenfield's pathology. But the pathologists also tell us that these things are kind of can be scattered all over and, and so there are some cells of each different type in each different area. So our gland looks structurally like this, and this is just to kind of go over the nervous supply, which comes down from the hypothalamus. Can you all see my pointer or not? Yes, it's yeah, just small. See. Okay, it's small. I, I should have made it bigger, but I don't know how to do that on the fly. Um, but anyway, the nerve structures here and here all come down along the infundibular and back to the posterior pituitary. Of course, our, our portal venous system comes down along the stalk and it comes all the way around. So if this doesn't descend, these never form and there's no way for the releasing hormones from here to get down to the anterior pituitary. Our blood supply, besides this portal venous system, we have a superior hypophyseal artery and this inferior hypophyseal artery here. Now, there's also some interconnecting veins here that are called communicating, or I'm sorry, interconnecting arteries called the communicating arteries here. Uh, and then we have these structures that are lumped together over here, which is the tuber scenarium, which actually includes all of this area going all the way back to the mammillary bodies. The, but this is a median eminence, and then this part being the infundibulum. There's these famous tracts here are our, tub our tuberohypophyseal tracts, our paraventriculo hypophyseal tract, our supraoptico hypophyseal tracts that help get the, the secretory hormones in the hypothalamus back to the posterior pituitary where we're going to get the vasopressin and oxytocin. So 
to just kind of look at all these different nuclei. There are several key nuclei down here <clears throat> in terms of secretion where we have these supraoptic, suprachiasmatic, a median eminence. Oops, I jumped ahead here. There we go. Median eminence, the ventromedian nucleus, arcuate nucleus, subventricular nucleus, and periventricular nucleus, which is way up here. And these is that you can see is sending these fibers all the way down, you know, to the posterior pituitary there. So these are our hormone secreting. These are important over here. This is kind of our median eminence area again, this being our mammillary body and this all of this region in here being our tuber scenarium. So uh, we're going to look at them in real time then, the mammillary body, third ventricles, the cella, dorsa cella, clinoid process, tuberculum cella, and supracellar cistern. So first I'm going to kind of, I think, show you the bony structures here. These are, this is kind of a bird's eye view where the top of the skull is taken off and we have this, po the uh, posterior clinoid processes back here our anterior clinoid processes, our tuberculum cella here, the back uh, between our two uh, dorsum, uh, between our two posterior clinoid processes and our dorsum cella here is our dorsum cella here, and it makes a posterior wall of the pituitary. Now, over along here, there's normally dura because the inside here is are the cavernous sinuses here where it's coming up from the lacerol portions into the cavernous sinus and our carotid arteries come up along there. So in MR, it looks like this. There's our, I've kind of color coded this. So this is our infundibulum. That's our optic chiasm, which is a good landmark. We see our pituitary infundibulum come down right behind the optic chiasm there. Uh, this is our schizoid, our cingulate gyrus, our corpus callosum. And then this is our tuber scenarium right in here. So the infundibulum also, because it's full of sinusoids as well, also avidly enhances here. So you notice the gland always enhances anteriorly. This is what it looks like in non-enhanced, where it's basically isointense to gray matter, has that same appearance on T2. And then this is the post-contrast images, which we always use if we can, let me tell you, we don't give contrast enhancement is in uh, pregnant patients whenever, you know, because we don't want to get this gadolinium into the developing kidneys. That can be catastrophic, so we try and avoid that. This is just a sagittal view, again, showing us our pituitary gland and our same structures. So now that you know where and what to look for on MR, these are the ways I'm going to sort of subdivide the pathology, those that occur because of embryological errors, those that are vascular diseases, then inflammatory diseases, and our biggest category is going to be neoplasms. And I'm going to break those down into those of the infundibulum and posterior pituitary, those of the anterior pituitary, those in the hypothalamus. I excluded these from this lecture. I usually do this with the residents, but just to save some time, we're going to skip over those. So starting here with congenital lesions, oops, this thing keeps jumping around on me, so I hope you'll be patient with me. Congenital lesions here, I like to refer to them as what got left behind or what got confused where to go. Now, we know the signaling pathways and, and things involved in a lot of these now a lot better than we used to, but that's basically what happened. They got the wrong direction because of some genetic sequence that wasn't there or some genetic sequence that got duplicated. So we get these ectopic or dystopic neurohypothesis, and that's one everyone's familiar with. We also have an ectopic pituitary in the adenohypothesis, and these are pretty rare, but they're very interesting. I've seen one here in Louisville. We've had one case of this here in Louisville. I had another case earlier in my career that I'll show you. And then we have the Rathke's remnants that ascend, that get ascend into the pituitary, and we end up with a Rathke's cleft cyst, and these are very common. And then more ominously are the craniopharyngiomas, which although who grade one have this local recurrent problem, 
and uh, they can be a real cantankerous thing to try and handle. So let's start with this Rathke's cleft cyst since it's so common. So they often occur, as I talked about earlier, about the, the pars intermedia coming from Rathke's pouch as well. So we end up seeing a lot of Rathke's cleft, cleft cysts right there between the posterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary. Now the gland parts then are compressed in both directions by this big cyst that forms in between. Now this cyst can look like a, a, a CSF type cyst. It can be this signal, almost zero signal, on T1 images, or it can be like this one, very T2 bright. This tends to correlate with the, what neurosurgeons refer to as crankcase oil-like appearance of it. So prognaceous fluid will often have a T1 hyperintensity uh, to it. Uh, and, and we see that also in uh, cranial, sometimes in craniopharyngiomas too. So this is a non-contrast study. This will then appear very dark, usually on T2 weighted images, but if it's not such an oily appearing cyst, uh, it might be very bright on T2 and dark on T1. And it's about 50-50 in our breakdown. The next thing we talked about, the non-descended neural hypothesis. This is a great example. We have this pituitary bright spot here. Uh, this is post-contrast, but this is non-contrast, and you can see it right here where I've got the arrow pointing to it. When that doesn't descend, we don't get an infundibulum at all. Sometimes you get a little bit of an infundibulum uh, that occurs with it, but other times you don't get any. Now, the interesting thing is, is when it doesn't descend, then the pituitary gland doesn't develop very well. Not only can it not get releasing hormones, but it doesn't complete its development. And so you end up with these sort of micro tersicas associated with this. So this one has all of the findings. Now, a lot of times there's a lot of variation. You might have a more normal appearing cella. You might have a hair-like infundibulum. Sometimes this descends halfway and not all the way. So you get a lot of variations, but this was such a beautiful one that I had early on in my career. It had sort of everything. Now this is the opposite. This is the, the anterior pituitary tissue. We thought for sure this was gonna be a chordoma. It's in the classic location of the clivus, which is this structure here. And we saw a normal pituitary tissue here. So some of the, enough pituitary tissue made it uh, that formed a normal gland and the person had normal endocrine function, but they had this part that didn't make it and developed pituitary tissue here within the clivus. So the surgeons took this out thinking that this thing was gonna, you know, everybody was pretty convinced this was gonna be a chordoma or a chondrosarcoma. We had a big lucent spot here. Uh, <clears throat> so we were all quite shocked when Dr. DeMasters comes back and says, uh, no, this is a uh, normal pituitary <laughs> tissue. Here. This, is, this is an ectopic anterior pituitary gland. So I think it's a beautiful example. So I've kind of kept that. So now we can, we're going to go into the stalk and neurohypophyseal lesions here. And we're going to cover the neoplasms and the hamartomas. So in the stalk, so a lot of these occur also in the posterior, in the neurohypothesis. Some of these can occur in the anterior gland too because they're non-glandular pituitary tissues. So we have the pituitocytoma, granular cell tumors, the tumors of the neurohypothesis, oncocytomas, which are a spindle cell oncocytoma. We have eosinophilic granulomas, which are, <clears throat> are from our histiocytosis family. Germinomas, oddly enough, germinomas occur not just in gonadal tissue, but they occur in the pineal gland and up around the pituitary gland. So they're in our differential for things in this area. Up, up in the hypothalamus, uh, we have who grade one astrocytomas or JPAs. Rarely in this region we'll see 
lymphomas in rarer than rare is the hemangioblastomas. I only know they occur there because I had a case of it. So this was a another one of those mystery tumors that it was extremely avidly enhancing. It had some uh, peripheral hemosiderin deposition around it, which causes this low signal on GRE images. It was very bright. It was kind of wet looking. It looked uh, bright, very T2 bright on the flare and the T2 weighted images. It was right in the infundibulum itself. So we got a normal gland. It's in the infundibulum. It's very avidly enhancing. And when the surgeons took this thing out, lo and behold, that was a hemangioblastoma. It had they're normally in the posterior fossa. They're rare in the supratentorial area unless a person has von Hippolendau. This one had it here, and they did not have von Hippolendau. So it was a really odd occurrence. So you have to be prepared for the unknown. As I like to tell my residents, tumors just don't always read the textbooks. Now, this is more common what occurs in the infundibulum, and that's eosinophilic granuloma, and this is a nice case of that. As you could see, this would be something we couldn't distinguish from a, the hemangioblastoma, the shape alone, and those sorts of things wouldn't do it. But this is EG, and, and one of the wings that helped us with this one on the diagnosis was they also had this beveled lytic lesion in the skull, which is pretty classic for eosinophilic granuloma. It's a little old for, for uh, EG, but for but 38 year old male, but it was still what it turned out to be. It's not out of the realm for that. Once we see 40s, 50s, we start not thinking so much about histiocytosis. So in the adenal hypothesis, we're going to start with less aggressive, and then we're going to go to some of the more aggressive tumors. In the less aggressive, we have these macroadenomas. Uh, they're used often, not, I wouldn't say usual, but often non-functioning. Uh, they're often indistinguishable from oncocytomas or pituitocytomas. Then we have them, but they're way more common than either of those. Pituitocytes or the non glandular comes from the non glandular cells of the pituitary gland. Oncocytomas occur in a lot of different tissues. They're a spindle shaped tumor, and I'm not sure a lot's been unraveled about those. Uh, they just tend to happen here and there. Microadenomas are often functioning, and that's why we catch them early because endocrinologists pick them up. <laughs> You, they're secreting prolactin or one of the other hormones. So we have prolact, any of these hormones, they can secrete any of these. Uh, in thyroid stimulating hormone uh, tumors, they're usually mixed. There's not that pure, and I'll let Dr. Winter correct me if I'm wrong there, but I believe they're usually mixed secretions uh, with the TSH tumors. So the prolactinomas, when we call them macro or micro, it doesn't have any histological basis. It's simply they're less than a centimeter or more than a centimeter in size. And in the imaging world, that's all we use to distinguish them. So the micros are less, and they have a tendency to be less avidly enhancing than normal tissue. Up here on the non-enhanced, you see they, they, this, this one's off to the side and kind of in the middle. But uh, as we get to the other side, it's the gland is much smaller in appearance. Let me go backwards here for a minute. But when the gland enhances, this enhances less avidly. But sometimes it can enhance late. If the later we enhance them, the more they look like normal pituitary tissue. So we they're best imaged dynamically. So we do these dynamic sequences where we put the contrast in really fast. And then we image, and in this case, we see this prolactinoma over here off to the side where we said we expect to see them. It's a little larger there. Can that be just normal gland or pituitary hyperplasia? Well, it could be, but when you image them dynamically, the tumor stands out. Notice on T2, they're usually kind of invisible. You, you can't really find them very well. This is an, uh, so then this is a macroadenoma. And it's just the difference, it's just bigger than a centimeter. But you can see, while it 
we look at it in a smaller field of view here, we look at it on a larger coronal field of view, we can see this sun is really quite big. So unlike the other one, which was a little bump, this one's a big, greater than one centimeter mass off to the side. Once again, we don't see it enhancing as avidly as the other side of the gland, but if you wait long enough on these, a lot of times they will enhance. Um, now this one here is, is a tricky one. This one is, even though my slide title says macroadenoma, this is pituitary hyperplasia here. So pituitary hyperplasia in a young female patient can look like a macroadenoma. And I include this to remind people that if you're looking at a 25 year old and you see it doming up at the top, don't worry about it. That's just what it looks like in young female patients and pregnant patients because the pituitary gland changes sizes, it atrophies as we get older, just like other brain tissue does, and we see a lot of changes in the way it looks. So some other non-aggressive lesions that we're going to look at, some of these spindle cell oncocytoma of adenohypophysis, and we talked about pituitary hyperplasia, and then we're, there are also these rare primary melanocytic tumors. This is, I don't have examples of the last one, I don't believe, but this is just your typical oncocytoma or spindle cell oncocytoma. And notice it's very heterogeneous, both in non-contrast and post-contrast images. Now, they can be solidly enhancing too. So just because this one's heterogeneous, don't think that they're all like that. This one happened to have a lot of, of, of uh, hemosiderin deposition in it, and so it looked very low signal on gradient echo, and we can see the kind of stippled appearance here. But I've had several different types of pituitary tumors that all had some of these same features, uh, in, including things like craniopharyngiomas. As we get into the more aggressive, we can have the pituitary adenoma sometimes can be really invasive. Uh, and then we have a pituitary carcinoma, and out of those, 75% are functioning. Mets do occur. We've got all those sinusoids. Why wouldn't a vet, a metastasis looking for a, a place to get out of the bloodstream, want to go in the pituitary gland? Well, they do. Uh, rarely we see lymphoma in, in that area, and cranial pharyngiomas are fairly common. I put them in the more aggressive, not because of their WHO grade, but because they can be very in, invasive. So this is an invasive pituitary macroadenoma. So it looks a whole lot different than the nice, well-behaved one we saw before. You can see how it's invading into the cavernous sinuses. It's grown way up beyond the supercellular system and is putting a lot of mass effect on the brain. And this is just a T2 signal. It's very heterogeneous here, and it's gotten into everything. So this is its cousin, uh, one that grew down instead of up. That's why I'm calling it. They're both macroadenomas, uh, and they're both invasive. But this one grows down, and sometimes they can do a lot of destruction. They can break through the cell, like get into the sphenoid sinus, and they can eat holes in the clivus sometimes. So we see all of those things happening with these more invasive macroadenoma. And no matter how invasive it is, it isn't, it is not considered a pituitary carcinoma unless there are distant metastases. Now, so these are just some more pictures of the same one. Now, I don't have a pituitary carcinoma to show you in my life. Career as a neuroradiologist, I'm still waiting for my first. I'm sure one will come along, and I guess I could scavenge one out of the inline, online literature, but what fun is that? So we're going to go into the paracellar lesions here, you know, and the thalamus and, high, and optic chiasm, because these things can also affect the endocrinology, because they affect the hypothalamus, who gives us our releasing hormones and our sick in our secretions um, for the posterior pituitary gland. So things that occur around here, JPA of the optic chiasm, these can, that's a juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma. They, they are often associated with neurofibromatosis type one. 
but they can also invade the hypothalamus and they tend to be very infiltrative. Um, <clears throat> and so they can get into any of the structures around them. Um, <clears throat> then we have something that's very well behaved and that's the hamartoma or the tuber scenarium. Then we can also have the more, even more infiltrative fibrillary astrocytomas of the hypothalamus and rarely we can even get gangliocytomas in, the, in that area. <clears throat> I'm still waiting for my first of those too. This is our famous hypothalamic hamartoma which causes gelastic seizures. So to get my residents to remember it, I always tell them that the joker had a hypothalamic hamartoma. Um, or a hamartoma of the tuber scenarium. And they're often pedunculated like this and they tend to follow gray matter on all pulse sequences. They typically do not enhance. If we see it enhancing, we start thinking it's something else. And being a hamartoma, it's just really neural and glial tissue <clears throat> that's uh, all mixed up and doesn't differentiate. Uh, it's a very common location. There also, I think associated with um, uh, pitu uh, other pituitary hormonal dysfunctions as well, but they're most commonly known for their gelastic seizures, but precocious puberty is another uh, feature of those. <clears throat> this is a JPA of the optic chiasm, our pituitary glands down here. Our normal optic chiasm would be in front of the infundibulum here. But as this infiltrates, this one's infiltrated the hypothalamus and the tuber scenarium and everywhere else along there. And those, you can see the, how huge the optic nerves are. They're about three times the size they ought to be. And there's our infundibulum coming down. You can see it's kind of iso intense to gray matter on the T2 weighted images. But when you see a very enlarged optic chiasm like this for a radiologist, that should be a slam dunk. So paracellar and supercellar tumors we're going to touch on briefly because all of these can grow down into the cella. And they're common, they're fairly common. Meningiomas are real common in this area. Craniofemiciomas, we usually pick those up in childhood, but we also see them in, uh, we also catch them in the adult population. They tend to be of two different histologic type. The adenomatous type with childhood we usually see less than the, the uh, papillary types that occur more commonly in adults. We can get METs in and around the cell of the lipomas, germ cell tumors, and rarely supercellar cordomas. Usually they're in the clivus, but this is a meningioma, and it, they I like to occur right here, right? I'll come in off the planum sphenoid alley and grow down towards the pituitary be very easy to say, oh, that's a big pituitary adenoma, and it grew up. Well, there are some telltale signs. You've got normal pituitary tissue here. That doesn't in itself mean it's not an adenoma. It has a dural tail and a broad dural base. It's very avidly enhancing. And this one, I think we had quite a debate about it, but it actually was, it came back a meningioma. These coronal views, I think this is what clued me whenever I told the neurosurgeon, I said, you know, that just looks like a normal pituitary gland to me. I think this is growing down. Here's where its attachment is to the dura, right, right at the, um, um, uh, uh, the cella tubercle there. Tuberculum cella, thank you. I had to get my brain wrapped around it. Here we go. This is a lipoma. Now, when we see this, how do you know this isn't a leftover, non-descended neural hypothesis? Well, we have a bright spot down here. We have an infundibulum here. We have a normal size cella. So we have the other features that we didn't have in the first case that I showed you of the non-descended neural hypothesis. We can test this by doing fat saturation. Uh, it's a special pulse sequence that we can use. You notice here, all the fat's bright. Here it's all dark. This fat is bright. This fat is dark. So that's a slam dunk. We now know this is a lipoma. That's as good as pathology. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
These are just the sagittal images showing the same thing. So craniopharyngiomas, this, <clears throat> this one is like has a peripheral enhancement. It's got a central cystic characteristics. They are, because they're kind of um, mesenchymal in their features, they have a lot of different tissue subtypes. They can have calcium in them. They can have cystic components. On the other hand, they can just be solid and enhancing sometimes too and look like uh, some of our other solid enhancing tumor lesions. This one, you can see the kind of cystic types. We can see dark spots in here, which represent calcium and some peripheral enhancement. So this is a great place for this one, of course, occurring pretty much along the infundibulum and lower thalamus. They can occur in the third ventricle back here, or they can occur in, in the pituitary fossa itself. This is a metastatic lesion. This one, a lot of times these will come from the pituitary. They can also come from the bone, but this one was kind of centered around the dorsum cella. I wondered if it started there, but it's destroyed so much, you can't really tell. It's invaded the cavernous sinuses. So these tend to be very infiltrative and destructive. It's gone right through, it's gone right you know, through the bony structure of the clivus back here, and it's growing in the prepontine cistern here. So this is a good picture for a metastasis. We're going to see those in older patients. Usually we use 40 as kind of a break point when we really start thinking about those. This is my friendly supracellar chordoma here that occurred. So when we look at this on the sagittal view, you're wondering, well, what is that? Is that a craniopharyngioma? Is that a mat? It's some kind of an aggressive tumor. Is it just an invasive macroadenoma? But this one actually turned out to be a supracellar chordoma. That's what I have to say about tumors. So how are we doing time-wise? I don't have a watch here, so. You have 20 minutes. Great, we're, we're right on target. We're going to diverge now. We're going to go into one of those other arrows outside of the tumors that was the inflammatory infectious uh, lesions in the pituitary, infundibulum, and paracellar regions. So there's actually quite a few of these. Uh, there's lymphocytic hypophysitis, and most people know about this one, but there are also giant cell granulomas. Then we get our basilar meningitides like sarcoid TB and fungal infections. Then we also get these xanthogranulomas of the cella, or xantho, xanthomatous, also called xanthomatous hypophysitis. Then radiation around the area can also wreak havoc uh, with things. And then neurocystocercosis, which is something that you say, wow, that sounds strange. But neurocystocercosis in Colorado, where we saw a lot of it, or I saw a lot of it in the Boston area because of all the Caribbean communities, um, in the Boston area, <clears throat> it can, the, the little cysts will like to find places where the CSF isn't pulsating very much, and they can hang out. So they will get into the third ventricle, they'll get into the pituitary fossa. <clears throat> so they can hang out, in a, they'll get in the eyeball for one play, you know, they can get in, in, uh, into the optic nerve seats. Uh, they can get in, be in the fourth ventricle. So they like to get into a lot of places where they are kind of protected from CSF pulsations. So they tend to settle out in these quiescent areas. So we'll give you some examples here. This is a neurocystocercosis. Cyst this is a large cyst. It's in the third ventricle actually, and it's, it's come down here to the tuber scenarium, and it's depressing that bodily here between our infundibulum and our mammillary bodies here. This is what it looks like. Now here we can see the little scolex that's enhancing. This is the worm part of it, the rest of it's cyst. And this is a little bit of it right here too with the cyst part back here. So when we see more than one cyst form, coming together to form these sort of complex cysts, it's referred to as racemos, which means, I guess, Latin translation is grape-like or whatever, because they make grape-like clusters of it. <clears throat> but these are the T2-weighted images, and we can see the little dark portion of the worms in there. 
They're sometimes bright on flare and they show up pretty nicely here. So this is a granulomatous infection. This is aspergillus. So fungal infections tend to cause these big granulomas that have a lot of enhancement associated with them. Uh, they, we can usually tell those from most other things uh, because the granulomatous infections often not only in, invade the pituitary fossa, but they get in the infundibulum, but they get in a lot of surrounding other structures and they cause a more diffuse leptomeningitis. This is just aspergillus. This one is sarcoid. And I think we've had some wonderful sarcoid cases. Dr. Winters is an expert on that, on uh, sarcoid on these things. And you can see some of the granulomatous infection that's gotten in meningitis in other parts of the leptomeninges. But here it is in the stalk and then, uh, you know, invading our area along the hypothalamus there. This is just what it looks like on flare images. So where flare signals should be nulled out in the cisterns. Instead, we have this high signal. Sorry, this thing keeps jumping around on me here. I think it's in my mouse here. Let me get back. This one is TB. And you can say, how can you tell fungal from TB from sarcoid? And the bottom line is we can't. All we can say is it's behaving like a granuloma this infection. This one's gotten really into the gland as well as the infundibulum, into the inner peduncular cistern and all over it. So we got a leptomeningitis going here. It can be any of those. TB is easiest to separate clinically because the patients tend to be really sick. Sarcoid tends to be patients that are walking around and not all that sick, if, if sick at all sometimes. Uh, fungal infections are kind of in between. We've seen people with fungal meningitides that are walking around and doing quite well uh, up to a point, and then they eventually get fairly sick. So uh, it's usually good old CSF that helps us differentiate the fungal infections from sarcoidosis. So this is a case of, this is a rather rampant case of lymphocytic hypophysitis. This disease was a big mystery for many years. For many years, it was, oh, it only occurs in young female patients. It's in the anterior pituitary. Then came along cases in the infundibulum, like this one, that also invaded the hypothalamus. And, the, and then there were neurohypophysial ones, and oh, they were more common in men. And there were a lot of epidemiological data about them. Uh, and now they've been sorted out a lot more genetically. Now, Dr. Winter can go through that in probably much better detail than I am, but right now, a lot of these, especially ones like this in the neurohypophysis, are part of these IgG4-related diseases that includes things like pseudotumor or <clears throat> um, orbital pseudotumor, uh, Wegener's granulomatosis, <clears throat> and, and others where we have these sort of uh, lymph, uh, it's lymphocytic pachymeningitis, hypertrophic pachymeningitis, and, and several other uh, pachymeningeal diseases that occur in the brain and spinal cord that are all part, that of uh, all different branches of the same IgG4 disease. So they tend to be polyclonal lymphocytic infiltrates that uh, with uh, that are linked to abnormalities or genetic defects in IgG4 or that are associated with IgG4, I suppose. Uh, but anyway, there, this is one of those lymphocytic hypophysitis is now lumped mostly into that category. Uh, so I'll let Dr. Winner at the end of this discuss that a little further because I know he knows a lot more about it than I do. These are just the uh, pictures in the of it also where it invaded into the optic chiasm and the pituitary gland. So it behaves a lot like lymphoma. Lymphoma likes to infiltrate everything around it. And these are instead of monoclonal as lymphoma is, they're polyclonal lymphocytic diseases. This one is that xanthomatous hypophysitis. And so we've got this big mass here that avidly enhances. It's T2 dark. How do you know this isn't a pituitary adenoma? Well, statistically, if you saw these images, 
that a macroadenoma would probably be your first choice here. It does look like whatever this is, is kind of flattening the pituitary tissue here. It's invading the cavernous sinus. But this could certainly, there's no way you could say this is not a pituitary adenoma or some of the other entities that we've looked at here. If you looked at it here, we do see it's kind of swirly enhancement. It's not homogeneous. Does that exclude a pituitary adenoma? Absolutely not. It could be a cranial pharyngioma. So we can't really tell these things apart until the surgeon puts it into the bucket and it goes to the pathologist. So lastly, I'm going to go into these sort of vasculous and vascular and miscellaneous because there's some misconceptions about some of these things that I want to kind of go through. We can have silent hemorrhages in the pituitary gland. It can be infarcted where it's called Sheehan syndrome if it's during pregnancy. If it's not during pregnancy, it's called Simmons syndrome. And then pituitary apoplexy, which is not an infarction, but just a hemorrhage. So this is a typical pituitary hemorrhage. It's kind of, it's hard to tell. You kind of think this is enhancing, and it is peripherally. And hematomas tend to enhance peripherally when they've been in there a while. Um, they don't enhance at all normally early on. But this one has some enhancement, and they often occur within or around a macroadenoma. They're out the edge or in the middle of an macroadenoma or micro, even microadenomas. We can even have hemorrhages inside Rathke's cleft cysts. So there's probably other tissue here that's helping this to enhance. This is a, uh, a coronal view, and here we see a more typical appearance of a hematoma. It's kind of hyper, T1 hyper intense here. It's very bright on T2 weighted images. And then we have some peripheral enhancement around it. One of the tip-offs here is when you look at it in a reclined in a reclined position. All of these are actually in a reclined position, but we see the the blood level settling out here on the flare sequence. So that's real helpful when we see a fluid fluid level like that. We know we're dealing with a hematoma, but it's probably a hematoma within an adenoma here. So other things around this area, we can see Wernicke's encephalopathy, which involves some mammillary bodies, uh, hemochromatosis. And then I'm going to spend a, show you some pictures of the empty cella pattern or empty cella syndrome. These can get subdivided into partial empty cella and empty cella based on how, you know, what thickness the residual pituitary is. And my answer is, what does that really matter? It doesn't change things very much. So in order to really call it a partial empty cell, I want you have to be careful because as we get older, if you look at my pituitary gland, it probably looks a lot like this because it's atrophied, right? As we get older, our pituitary gland atrophies. They're sitting in the bottom of the cell. The keys to the diagnosis of when it's really a partial empty cell is the infundibulum will often be deviated. It can be deviated posteriorly, anteriorly, or it can remain in the middle. And we see the pituitary gland flatness, a small crescent against the base, but the biggest key is the cell is expanded here. <coughs> Normal atrophy <clears throat> doesn't really have an expanded cell up. So these things are caused Normally, our dura comes, or, or our uh, pioratinoid, well, actually, our arachnoid comes up around the cella and is closely approximated to the pituitary stalk. Now, <clears throat> some people are born with a defect, so just like, and we get a herniation then into the gland, and it pushes it backwards, and we get this shape that we just saw. <coughs> Excuse me, I want to take a quick drink. The same thing can happen back here, but it's more common for it to happen anteriorly. And this is can be an nothing more than an anatomic variant. So you can see these sometimes in young people. <clears throat> now there are empirical papers out there that say, oh, they are more highly cor they're correlated with 
increased CSF pressure, and it's all done from CSF pulsations. And my attitude towards that is, come on. Let's talk about CSF pulsations, of which I've done a, a lot of experiments. CSF pulsation, when you, whenever you tap into somebody, the normal CSF pulsation is about one to two millimeters of mercury. That's not much force, my friends, to cause any kind of a mechanical change. So these things come mostly from involution or from congenital defects. Now, over a long period of time, if you have someone with really elevated CSF, they can have more, but again, we're talking a few millimeters <clears throat> of mer a few millimeters of water column, not even mercury, a few millimeters of water column. So we really don't have these big water hammer forces in our CSF. We have a few millimeters of mercury bumping up and down. But empirically, you can see them more commonly, you can see them more commonly in patients who have elevated CSF pressure, but the large majority that you see them on are gonna have be, have normal CSF pressure. Uh, so I think we have to rethink some of those ideas because they don't physically really kind of meet my threshold for taking them seriously. And there we go. Okay, so here's uh, what it looks like, <clears throat> a big expanded cella with this filled with CSF signal here, very dark. Uh, on, this is on the CT, this is on the MRI, and we can see that pituitary gland deviated downward here in the infundibulum pushed posteriorly. And I think that's my last slide. So are there any questions? Dr. Burke? Yes. This is, this is Satya Krishnasamy. Thank you. That was a very nice review. Um, so a couple of questions. One is quite basic, but that's more for the benefit of our newer fellows. And for me, just as a revisionist, you talk about T1, T2, then you, you talk bright, and then you have enhancement, right? So can you kind of explain that uh, just a brief review? Sure. <clears throat> Let me start out with the basics on MR. Is all MR... MR, there's really three different things that control the signal that we get out of it that we make these pretty images with. Uh, one of them is T1-weighted image, and that's the tendency of protons to align in the magnetic field. So what we do in MR is we put you in a magnet and you get some, most of your, your protons are aligned in all random directions, but there's a tendency for some to align with the magnetic field more than against magnetic field. And it actually turns out to be like one in 100,000, but there's so many protons in the body that it's enough that if you disturb that, you get an electrical signal out of it. So typically we mix all the protons up and as they come back together to realign, it makes an electrical signal. And that's what our T1 image is reflecting. Uh, and so every tissue has its own signal. And so when we say T1 bright, we're talking about the intrinsic signal like fat without any contrast or white matter versus gray matter, which is darker <clears throat> in a signal or muscle, which is darker. T2 is, and so we tend to give a simplified way to remember T1 is White matters white and gray matters gray, okay? Uh, T2 is kind of the opposite, where let me show you a T2 weighted image here, where gray matters lighter than white matter, so it's the opposite. Now, whenever we make this pulse, put this pulse into the tissue to scramble all the protons and make them haphazard and let them realign, it does a funny thing, it synchronizes them. And so they're all rotating together. And so it's like a bunch of spinning tops that are all wobbling and their wobbles are all synchronized. But as time goes on, if you did a, had a bunch of jacks, you would notice one starts falling out, then another, then another. So 
they eventually lose their synchronization. And when that happens, we then refocus them and make them realign again. And when that happens, we get an electrical signal. That's T2. And so in T2 weighted images that tend to synchronize and desynchronize, we get a different signal from a different, and it has different properties in the tissue. So white matter tends to be dark and gray matter tends to be bright. <clears throat> now we can, we have gadolinium and different iron, different agents can change the magnetic field locally. <clears throat> and so when we inject gadolinium, it actually has this T1, it's called T1 shortening effect, which in essence makes things very bright on MR imaging, like fat. Fat has a naturally real short T1. So it's very bright on T1-weighted images. It's in, in turbospin echo, for another reason I won't go into, it's also bright on T2. But if you do conventional T2-weighted imaging, it's quite dark. It looks like a stir. <clears throat> so when we use this, um, these T2-weighted images, uh, we're looking at a different property of things. And, and a lot of times the properties are sort of opposite. What's bright on T1 is dark on T2. But that's not always the case. There are some things that are bright on both depend because the two properties are literally independent, um, but they both affect the overall electrical signal. So they're kind of linked, but they're kind of, so they're kind of convoluted because they're both part of the same spinnacle formula that describes things mathematically, but they have these different properties. So we want to, so we can use those different properties to our advantage. And so this gadolinium that makes T2 short, it has to get into the tissues in order for that to happen. And so it needs to leak out of the bloodstream and get into the interstitial space before we really see it uh, very well. So what we're looking at is free gadolinium in the interstitial space when we see enhancements. So when the pituitary enhancements, because the gadoliniums can leak out. So in areas like the blood that have a tight blood brain barrier, the gadolinium doesn't leak out and we can't see anything. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. That was helpful. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I'll give an opportunity to the others um, before I ask them. But I did want to share the last time you gave a talk, we didn't have a mechanism to have patients with pacemaker have MRI, but now at the VA, we do have that mechanism where even if they have pacemakers, as long as we make um, plan plan ahead, we are able to do that. I don't know if we have that ability in here in our MRI suite. Well, there's those are very complicated issues um, because what's happened is they've come out with pacemakers and things like that that are now MR compatible. Okay. So a lot of it depends on when it was put in and what type it is and what manufacture was done. And we've also had more experience over time. In the early days, people would accidentally go into the magnet with a pacemaker. It would trip the pacemaker and they'd go into a cardiac arrest and it was a disaster. <clears throat> so they, you know, everyone rushed and said, don't do anything. It was like the COVID Mm -hmm. 19 and back in March when we didn't know anything about it, it was like we just have to shut everything down until we until we find out more about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of how we, it was with the pacemakers. And so as we they learned about it, and then designers got involved and started making ones that were more MR compatible. And then there were vagus nerve stimulators. We used to say you can't do someone with vagus nerve stimulators. We do them fairly often now, but we have to turn mm -hmm. them on and off. Or in some cases, like with the cardiac pacemakers, you have to have a cardiologist there mm -hmm. so that he can deal with it. You can, if anything happens, he can pull the patient out and he can make the adjustments and uh, mm -hmm. as necessary. But it's also a big difference in the technology because you know we have ventilator machines that are MR compatible now. Mm -hmm. We have pacemakers. So we even have cochlear implants that are MR compatible now. Uh, so it depends on where they are. Now our techs all have a list of the manufacturers. So if you guys can get us the manufacturer and the type, they look it up and they can say, yeah, that's compatible or no, that's not compatible. Right. Thank you. Any other so questions? Uh, increasingly, 
these uh, hypophysitis from checkpoint inhibitors? Anything uh, specific about those on the MR? There really isn't anything that I'm aware of that's specific about those. It's just going to have the same the same kind of hypophysitis as as other inflammatory po processes. And as you know, I showed in my slide, we really can't tell hypophysitis from uh, lymph from lymphoma, from sarcoid, or other things. We usually can tell it from sarcoid. We just can't eliminate sarcoid because sarcoid usually involves a lot of other tissues around it, but sarcoid can once in a while be real, just show up in the infundibulum and the pituitary and not anywhere else. When that happens, you know, we really can't tell it from that. But the treatment's not all that different from the inflammatory things, items, uh, they all tend to be treated with steroids and heavy duty anti-inflammatory agents. So it, it's, it, it's kind of like we only have a hammer, so everything's a nail when it comes to inflammation of the pituitary, I guess. So, it, we, you know, there may be some differences in the doses that they're treated with, but uh, uh, it's not very easy to tell one type of an inflammatory process from another. Dr. Winner, do you want to comment on anything? No, that was a very, uh, let me see if I can turn myself. We can hear you, Dr. Winter. Oh, we heard you before. I think you just turned it off. We can't hear you. So the MR is the tool to study the, the anatomy of the pituitary and supracellular region. Is there any role for a clinician ordering a CT scan? Uh, in these disorders? The only time we order the CTs is when we have patients that, that have a contraindication to MRI. Mm -hmm. uh, a big one of that is claustrophobia, people that can't take it. But sometimes these days we put them under anesthesia or at least anesthesiologists can put them on propofol for a short, knock them out for a short enough time, you know, a short time, get to study and then bring them right back around. But there are people, you know, with pacemakers that are incompatible uh, or have other reasons. They have metal in their, in or around their orbit, uh, and, and the magnet can move that and cause some serious damage. Um, so when somebody has an indication like that, we have CT. So we don't do very many. We've probably done a two or three in the last year, maybe on CT. And, uh, you know, that's, it, it's just, we just don't get the the contrast resolution uh, very well on it, but sometimes it's our only other choice. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Um, so, Dr. Bert, I just have a follow-up on Dr. Mokshagandam's question, which was what I planned to ask you. If you recall, I sent you an email um, the week you were at the VA about a patient with um, ERVOI or a CTLA-4 immunomodulator used for melanoma, um, in this case for a different solid tumor. Um, and uh, it's um, it, uh, he came in and he did have a very low cortisol, pretty classic uh, labs. But the MRI did not show the hypophysitis. It rather just showed possible a tiny, like a microadenoma in the anterior pituitary. But uh, so is this, um, is that something, is it like a, a required criteria? Perhaps Dr. Winters can also, um, uh, you know, comment on it, um, that you have to diagnose the hypo, autoimmune hypophysitis uh, when you make these diagnoses, or you just can they just, uh, you know, there's low cortisol and they didn't have a brisk response. So independent of the imaging criteria that you call them hypophysitis. I'm gonna defer that to question to Dr. Winters because if it's not if it's not apparent on imaging, we can't, you know, that doesn't mean they don't have it because just like there are, you know, there are things like meningitis, for instance, that by the time we see it, it was diagnosed 
you know, weeks earlier uh, by CSF, fluid analysis. Mm -hmm. So I suppose, you know, if you know the disease and you know the criteria, that's going to be a clinical diagnosis. So Dr. Winner, you want to take that one? Yeah, no, I would agree. I mean, hypothesitis is a disease in evolution, so it depends on the timing of when the inflammation begins in part, and often the abnormalities will resolve over time. And I agree with Bob. I don't think that it's a sine qua non to have a radiographic abnormality. It's a clinical association between the uh, drugs uh, and uh, hypopituitarism. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? These are all great questions, by the way. Thank you, Dr. Wood. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, you all stay safe, and Dr. Winter, great seeing you again. My pleasure. Good luck, Bob. Thank you.